We'll go to the Lord. Take a moment and examine your life. Look for mental sins, verbal sins, overt sins. Also, I'm coming to understand when the Bible talks about the desires of the flesh, it's not just talking about sins. We think in terms of lascivious sins, but that's just a very small part of the desires of the flesh. The real focus of the desires of the flesh is what I call the human agenda, which is the plan that you and I form to find happiness and success and, and get what we're after in this life apart from God. I mean, whatever your plan is, and money, uh, success of some kind, uh, you know, romance, love, health, whatever it is you've decided that you have to have in an earthly sense that you're clinging to, that you're holding on to. That's your human agenda. And that's what you need to be aware of. All right? And, and I'm, I, I began to confess those things, my focus on those things to the Lord. So let's go to the Lord. Father, we're grateful for the awareness of the desires of the flesh and all that that entails. I don't think we've really come to understand it fully. I haven't. And so help me to see beyond just personal sin into my human agenda where I, I keep thinking that I can make my life work without you, that I don't need you to run my marriage or you know, resolve issues, that I'm supposed to do it myself, and that I don't, I don't need you to make my life work financially. I've set that up myself. It's my actions and my work that's done it. Help us to see that where we're focused in our life on those things. I, I love you, Lord. I pray you give us insight today about the way we live and the way we choose. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Last week, this study is a three-week study uh, and it's a model of human behavior. It's, it's, uh, it's just a basic uh, image, if you will, and I'll draw it for us. But last week we talked about desire and how desire is the motivator of the soul. That desire is really what drives us and, and pushes us to act, to pursue, to head for something. We're going to see today that that which we believe will we'll fulfill our desire or gratify our desire is what we pursue. It's what we focus on. Paul gives us into this idea of phreneo, which is the word focus. It's your thoughts. It's your focus. It's your intention. And it's a movement. It's a really important word. It's how you embrace either the spirit and the life that God has for you or you embrace the world in your human agenda and try to find your happiness and your success and your meaning and purpose out of this life. And that is so pervasive. It's just amazing to me how pervasive I know that every I know that when I'm frustrated about my life, about my marriage, about my children, about my health, about my finances, about whatever. I'm frustrated. That means that I have placed too much importance, too much faith, too much focus on my human agenda. Rather than surrendering that for God to use me in His arena, however He wants, to be a speaker or not be a speaker, to be able to even think and speak or not think and speak, that's up to him. He gets to decide the arena and the, and the opponent in, 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 as a gladiator. He gets to decide. So I have to let this go and I have to embrace his. So that's the essence that we're talking. Now, we looked last week at desire, how God designed us as needs-based. We're driven by our needs. And our needs feel like desires. I mean, I asked the kids downstairs, what is it that you want? 
I don't mean like I want a popsicle at break. I'm talking, what do you want for your life? And they're like, we don't know. I'm like, no kidding. It's really a journey to understand what you want. Because much of what you want, you don't really see. Well, here's a, here's a question. What are you pursuing? What is it you think about more than anything else? What do you focus on? Where does your mind go when you're by yourself? Or where does your mind go? What are your daydreams? What do you daydream about? They say there's are clues to what it is you've chosen to want. Because want, desire, is a reflection of need. And need reaches out and finds something to attach this hunger to. I want this. I want that. Why? Because I believe in this or that. So, we'll see that. We talked about hunger and thirst attached to the sin nature and to the world. It produces a temporary gratification, but it's idolatry. It leads us to a process of ever-increasing degeneration with diminishing satisfaction. You know that when you're pursuing something you're pursuing, you're pursuing something out of bounds. You know that. You know that when you're not really obeying God. If you don't know that, then you need to wake up. And then we saw what makes desire good or sinful is the object to which we have attached it and the motive behind it and the Spirit encourages us to reject the desire for the human agenda and attach our hunger and thirst to God. So, there are things that you want. Everybody wants. You're made that way. You can't help but want. Listen, what happens to people when their wants get them in trouble? People go through life and they have a hard time. Their life doesn't work well. Maybe in their family, their parents, their whatever, their marriage. And so they look for an escape. So they start to want an escape. So they drink or they do drugs or they watch porn or they do something. They get involved in some legitimate, they start running, you know, and they start, start off being healthy. And the next thing you know, they're running marathons and their life is devoted and focused on that. So it's an escape. And when they discover that I've attached my desires to an escape, oh, I keep getting myself in trouble, especially if it's like drinking or something. And so what people say is, I need to stop wanting. Just suppress my desires. If you're in a situation that's very difficult and you can't get out of it, and you, it's not what you want, then you think, well, I'm going to quit wanting anything. Well, good luck. Good luck with that because it won't work. You can numb it out and just kind of cover it over, but it's going to squirt out in all different areas of your life. It's just going to, it's going to, it's going to poison all the parts of your life because you're not real. You're not honest. Better off to let yourself desire and change what you want. Change what you want. Did you know you can do that? See, God says, I'm going to allow your life to go through these, these adversities. Maybe some of them are very severe, extreme. And you have to uh, come to the place where you are joyful about that, where you embrace that. You know, count it all joy. Be grateful for all things at all times. Because all things work together for what? Everything that's going on is all designed for your growth and for His glory and for eternal rewards. He's putting you through the pressure here to put you into a high position in the next go-around. That's what's going on. Now, will you take your faith and attach it to that? And will you accept that, that what you can't change that you must accept and that what God wants you to do is come to this point 
Where you're not, you're not ever going to want the adversity, but what you're going to want is what comes out of the adversity, which is your growth and your strength, your reward and God's glory. Now, the second, the second installment of this is, is methodology. So we start with the want and we move to a method. What do we do with our want? If I can find my notes here. All right, motivation. There's that and there's this. Okay. Uh, in review, in review, we just sort of did a review there, the, the desire. So let's look at method. I'm going to talk about three things, basically. One, four things is volition and attachment and then faith and focus. So let's, let's do a little preview. First, the first point is that we're, we're armed with volition. We have volition. That means we have the ability to choose. And therefore, we have the obligation to choose. We are responsible to choose. The whole shooting max, everything God is doing, is designed to get you and I to, in this spiritual arena, with angels in the stands, where we choose either for God or for ourselves. For Him or for the world. For Him or for my sin. Either way. When you choose for God, it's a vote for God in the angelic conflict. When you choose for yourself, it's, it's the same thing that the devil did. So you become a little devil. Some of you are already little devils. So you probably heard that before, hadn't you? All right. Now, secondly, I want to talk about attachment. And this is really important. And some say, well, that's a psychological. No. It's a biblical idea, and I'm going to show it to you. Attachment is, is a bond that forms. When you attach yourself, you attach your desire, your faith, your fear, your anger, your future, you attach to some object. You attach. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. It talks about attaching faith. So thirdly, we're going to talk about faith and how our hunger and thirst that is divinely designed drives us to reach out and find something to which we attach our faith and our desire, believing that it will fulfill us. You say, why is all this important? Well, look, if your life... If you're, if you're already like Jesus and you're not struggling, then you're probably good to go. But if you're struggling in areas of your life because you can't seem to come to terms with some issue and you're struggling to surrender or you're struggling to reconcile, make things work well in a situation, you need to understand what it is you're believing that is causing you to do and, and to think, to feel, to say and do what you're doing. You're part of this mix. You need to understand how that works. What is it that I'm believing that causes me to say this, to do this, to have this tone of voice, to have this attitude, to be resentful? Why am I resentful? Why can't I relax? Why can't I just let go? What am I nervous about? What am I upset about? What's going on? Why? How can't? Why? I've got the Holy Spirit. I've got the Word of God. Why am I not peaceful? Well, you can handle that. You can just try to suppress all that and go through the motions of life, or you can try to look at it honestly and, and reconnect, reconnect this stuff so that it works God's way smooths everything out. So, we're going to talk about faith. And then we're going to talk about focus. Focus is where we put our attention. What we are preoccupied with. 
Whatever we believe in and depend upon to supply our needs is where we're going to focus our minds. So, let's look at this first idea of volition. The divine design of the human soul is to have volition, which is the ability to choose, the opportunity to choose, and the obligation. First, the ability. People are, by divine design, able to choose and determine their own path and destiny. Listen, you are on the path you're on because it's the path you have chosen. If you don't like the path you're on, the situation you're in, choose differently. Quite often, you, your circumstances are beyond your choice, but your attitude within them is your choice. Is your choice. What you believe about it is your choice. So you have the ability, Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whom you will serve. Are you going to serve other gods or the Lord? He says, As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Every command to choose for yourself indicates that we each choose every thought, feeling, word, and deed. Here's what's important. Everything that you experience inside of yourself is your choice. Or it started with your choice. It began with your choice, and maybe you're something that's habituated and turned into a process that you're really not choosing, but you chose, and you are choosing. There was a person in my life that I was very keen on helping, very, very determined to help. And I tried to help for quite some time. And one day, I sat and looked at that person, and I realized, the Lord said to me, she has chosen to be what she is. She is what she's chosen to be. And what you're trying to do is interfere, inter intervene to get her to choose differently. She's been choosing this path for year after year after year, and it is a deep rut and groove in her life. Trying to get her out of that would be difficult at best. And I realized I'm trying to manipulate this person to be better for their sake, but you can't, you can't choose for other people. They have to choose. It's their journey, even your kids. It's their journey. And if they choose to be angry, if they choose to react, if they choose to not trust the Lord or learn about the Lord, it's their journey. So, secondly, there's an opportunity. God arranges creation so that all who will believe the gospel will hear it and believe it. He knows who's going to believe it. People say, well, what if... What about the people that never heard about Jesus? Well, I don't, I don't have the exact answer to that. But I do believe this. Everyone that God knew would believe the gospel heard the gospel. No matter where they lived, how it worked. I mean, if God had to fly an eagle in with a message and drop it on their head, I don't know. Everyone who would believe the gospel heard the gospel. Opportunity. That's Romans 10, 13 through 18. He says, The gospel has gone into all the earth, and the words of the gospel to the end of the world. Ends of the world. So, every idea to which we are exposed presents an opportunity for us to believe it or reject it. This is what I want you to understand, that, that every moment of every day, God is allowing things in your life for you to decide what you're going to believe and what you're not going to believe. You're going to, if you've learned the Word of God, you're going to take the Word of God and evaluate that situation and believe God or not believe God. All right? Thirdly, you have an obligation. Choices we make about believing specific ideas determines our eternal and temporal destiny. In John 3.36, whosoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God remains as it started out at birth. The wrath of God was on us. 
Christ paid for all that, and now when we believe in Him, we, we are free from the wrath. But if you don't believe, then you're still under wrath. Point is, we're forced to make a choice about what we'll accept as reality. How determined are you to face the reality that you're living? Very difficult these days. We live in a we live in a age of propaganda. We live in an age of a projected image and scenario that's been projected out and this a, a, a narrative that's being played out for the minds of people. We live in a difficult time. All the conveniences that we have, it was a simpler life before all the technology. Just a much simpler life. And you dealt with reality much easier. I mean, you, you watch a movie, you don't know what you're watching. Is that real? Did somebody do that? Actually? Or did they just CGI it, which is a computer-generated image, I guess. And, you know, so... The focus of, of the angelic conflict is our choices to believe and accept God or, with, or withhold faith and reject Him. His design of our lives requires that we make choices one moment at a time. What we will believe, think, feel, say, and do at any given moment. What God's focused on is, is your choices. This is the, this angelic conflict between God and the devil when the devil is, is asserting, declaring that God is not righteous. You go, well, how does he get that? Here's what it is. The devil, whatever the logic the devil used to rebel against God, he didn't just one day wake up and go, hey, I think I'm going to rebel today. He had an idea and a logic that he believed was more true than what God than God's will. I think it's what he told Eve. Listen, forget God. Go and make your own destiny. Go and make your own life. Live your life without God. You don't need God. Do your own thing. Of course, it's what you see today. I believe the devil thought that was righteous. Why do I have to be your slave? Why is it that I have to get up every single day of my life and do what you say, God? Why don't I get freedom? He said, freedom and my and and my to, the freedom to make my own destiny, that is what is right. And he was able to convince a third of the angels that that was that, that, that he was right about it. I don't know what they believed, but God said, no, that's not true. So the devil keeps asserting that he's right about this. And God's like, no, we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you how this thing plays out, you're going to see that you're not right about this. Everybody who moves away from me, God said, dies. I am life. I am the source of life. There is no, nothing else besides me. You move away from me and you go into this process of degeneration that ends up in absolute ruin. The only way is to come back to me. He is the source of life. He's the source of health. He's the source of everything good, of reality, of truth, of light. He, he designed us so that we're dependent upon Him for that. The moment we say, no, I'm going my own way, you begin to be destroyed. You destroy yourself. So, it's really important that we get our thoughts that are messed up inside realigned with Him so that we can get closer and closer to Him and get stronger and healthier. That's the idea. All right, what we choose to believe determines our path, our journey, and our destination. Listen. Listen to this. We're on a path within a journey that's going to end up with a destination, a target. The word sin, hamartia, literally means to miss the target. You know why you miss the target, which is God and righteousness and truth and light? You know why you miss the target? Because you aim at something else. Your human agenda is your life that you produce with your goals and your priorities and your focus that is about you in this life apart from God. That's, your, that's the desires of the flesh. 
it's not just fornicating. You know, we say that and we think, well, the lascivious sins. Way more than just the sin. What about ascetic sins? What about the desires of the flesh connected to asceticism? The desire to be self-righteous, the desire to look down on somebody else, the desire to be better than they are, the desire to condemn and, and criticize. Those are ascetic desires. Those are the lust of the flesh. Ascetic, so we choose. So, secondly, I want to talk about attachment. Attachment is a bond that forms from subject to object that forms when we choose to trust the object as a source of supply. Now, anybody in here who's ever, quote, fallen in love, if you've ever fallen in love, that's the idea of attachment. You know, you're going along and somebody comes along and then you attach. Whoa. This is my source of love. This is where my love's going to come from. I'm attached. I'm going to get my love from this person. So God designed the human soul with the ability to attach. And attachment is healthy, but it becomes unhealthy very quickly. If you attach yourself to the wrong person, to the wrong thing, the wrong situation, and trust in that for your needs, your desires, your supply, then you will definitely end up hurt and disappointed. Now, this word, this idea is like a child attaches to mother and caregivers. In the first year of life, a newborn baby attaches to mother. Just like physically, he attaches to her breast for nurturing, for nourishment, his soul, her soul, attaches to the mother's soul, to the mother in general. The, the babies don't differ. They just, it's just mother is this blob of good, of love, of warm, of nurturing, and everything good. Mama, come on, mama. Right? You attach. That's what that is. Later in life, you attach to a mate. When your kids come out, you can't help but attach to them. So, I worked with Glen Haven Youth Ranch. I was on their board for about six years, and I worked with some of these boys, and they had what's called attachment disorders. They had gone through the earlier part of their life, from, from birth to like two and three, heavily neglected, without anyone with whom they could attach. They... They were, these were teenage boys. They didn't under, they had no idea what that meant to attach. And, and from what I'm told, they will never be able to attach. They'll never be able to uh, trust and open and connect with somebody like that. They miss the development of that. Your brain has these things called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are where empathy comes from, where you look at each other and you can tell what each other's thinking and feeling. You connect. There's a connection there. And in your brain, your brain can see and connect with what's going on in another person's brain. That's what forms empathy. Well, if you go through the stages of growth where, and you miss all that, then that, just, that part of your brain never develops. So there are people walking around that don't, Married people successfully, they don't, don't ever really attach. They just go through the motions of doing the right thing and loving in a right way, which is ultimately what love really is. But there's something missing there. And you know if you're involved in that, that there's something missing. So maybe you're not able to attach. Or maybe you're around someone who doesn't have that capacity to attach. Uh, but... Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it's on your page. It says, for indeed, we also had the good news preached to us, just as they, the Exodus generation, also had the gospel preached to them. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united or attached with faith in those who heard it. 
This word soon karanumi means to mix together, to blend together, to attach something to uh, another thing. It means to attach faith to the message of the gospel. So somebody presents the gospel to you, the death, burial, and resurrection. You've come to understand your need for that. And so you take your faith and you attach it. I believe that. I believe that. I attach my faith. I believe that. That's how it works. So the ability to attach our faith or trust to people or ideas allows us to fully expect, I mean, accept nurture or influence. Listen, you're, the goal here, we've, we've attached ourselves to people and the things of this life, and it's unavoidable and normal and natural, but the goal in growth and maturity is to, is to detach and reattach, to attach to God and to believe in and trust God as the source of my nurturing and my love and my self-esteem and my approval and my acceptance. I'm accepted into the body of Christ. I get approval by walking in the Spirit. Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, I'm part of a family. I'm part of a mission. You know, I have a spiritual gift and, and spiritual power to be able to accomplish and have impact. All of those needs are met in Christ. And the goal is for me to attach all of my hunger and all of my thirst to Him. See, it's not to diminish hunger and thirst so that I don't get in trouble. It's to realign the thinking about it and attach hunger and thirst to God. To be passionate about God. To hunger for God and want God. See, we get in trouble in our life and so we try to quit wanting. Oh, don't start wanting. Don't want anything because that just gets you in trouble. Well, yeah, it does. But listen, when you, when you attach it properly, it makes everything work. It makes everything work right. So, once we make an attachment, it's difficult to change. This is like if you've ever, again, if you've ever been in love, you attached yourself to somebody and you expected that thing to go on and be your source and you were going to, this is going to go on, and then it ended. Boom. And they left, and they walked away, and they didn't want you anymore. And man, that hurt. Man, that hurt, because you had attached. See, if you had never attached, it'd be like, okay. That's why people don't do it. It's, it's safer that way. I know, but there's, <laughs> there's just no good stuff. It's just, it's just going through the motions. So... A broken attachment bond produces feelings of betrayal, rejection, and abandonment. And this is where defense mechanisms come from in your life, and you get all twisted up. You build walls, and you live behind walls, and you protect yourself, and you're not going to love anybody again, and you're not going to really give yourself to anything, and you live a mediocre life. So our volition attaches. We have this hunger and thirst that, that God is, has caused to, to be in us. And let me see if I can make this work. I did it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right, so here's this empty place, and this is where your needs and desires come from. All right, and it's just there. There's no getting rid of it. You can try to get rid of it. You can suppress it. It's there. You're going to want and need and long. Well, before Christ, here's God, and we're separated from God behind this barrier, these 13 charges. So all we can attach to, here's our attachment, are people. Mother, father, brother, sister, boyfriend, girlfriend, etc., and so we build all of our ideas and our beliefs. These are your beliefs that create your belief system. All right. So we attach ourselves to people and build all of our ideas around people, the things of this life. 
We love people. We want people to love us. We, we want people to approve of us. And we want people to accept us and include us and all of these things that we all want. I mean, I, every time I talk about this, I go back to junior high. You know, elementary school, I don't think I, I mean, I was asleep. It was just like in a trance. But once I got to like junior high and I started really noticing girls, I was like, whoa, how do you get one of those things to like you? And all the guys were like, we don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we don't know how to get one of them to like us. So, you know, you try to figure out how to talk and how to be cool. So you're developing these strategies to get accepted, to get approved, to get loved, to get wanted, and to be desired. And, you know, you wanted people to think you're something good. That's attachment to people. That same attachment is what we need with God, see? When, when we get saved, we've, we've, already, we've already maximized this over here. This is a full-blown system. It's going full blast. You're connected to people. You're pursuing people. You're posturing for people. You're putting on the face for people. You're doing your thing to make people. It's all people. Ha, ah, then comes God. Here comes Jesus Christ. So you attach your faith to Jesus Christ and it opens up this whole new life of the Holy Spirit and biblical principles, and you begin to build these new beliefs, hopefully. Did you know that every, every church doesn't do this? They don't discuss these things. They have an emotional type thing. Music and rah, rah, rah. They don't talk about principles and concepts and ideas. Uh, amazes me, but I mean, this is how you understand how to walk. So anyway... Here you are with Jesus Christ and God, and you can build this whole new thing, and now you can... But see, the problem is you've already attached over here. You've already attached. So how do you fall in love with two people at the same time? So you have to unattach. Paul calls it taking it off, and then you reattach over here to these, these beliefs and promises of God. So that's the system... That's the model. So you have volition to choose either side. You have volition. So you're going to choose the world system or you're going to choose God's system. And you're going to attach your faith. And out of your faith is going to come your hope or your expectations. And out of that's going to come your love. Either way, you use your volition to attach on either side of that. So that's how that works. Our faith, listen, your faith is the key element. The emptiness drives you to attach faith to some object. You can't just go through life without attaching to somebody to meet your needs. Imagine a little baby, mother is there and he goes, oh, okay, mom, I'm good. Right? S silly. You attach. And when you do, that becomes what you worship, becomes what you believe in, what you pursue, and what you focus on. I gotta finish up here. So you can read that about faith, and then there's focus. And if you will, if I didn't write this, would y'all turn in your Bibles real quick to Romans chapter eight? We're going to look at verse 4 and 5. She says, I guess I better get there too, huh? Because I don't have it memorized. Romans 8. He says in verse 4, He says that those who are walking in the Spirit are fulfilling the requirements of the law. 
And then in verse 5, for those who are walking according to the flesh have set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are walking according to the Spirit have set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, temporal death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, it does not submit or subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So, this word focus, have, have your mind set. Those who are walking according to the flesh have set their minds. So, this is the Greek word phroneo, and it's, I've given you some stuff on your paper. And that word, that's an E, phroneo, that word means to focus, it means to attach your mind to something, it means to dwell on something. Here's what it means. It means to dwell on something and think about something with intent of connecting to that or, or possessing that or being part of that. It is, so you're focused and you have intent with a movement within you toward it. That's for now. He says, if you're focused on the things of the Spirit, if you're walking in the Spirit, it means because you're focused on the things of the Spirit. So what he's saying, if you turn that logic around, is if you focus on the things of the Spirit, if you use your volition to attach your faith to the things of the Spirit, and then choose to focus your mind on the things of the Spirit, you will walk in the Spirit. You focus and you think, and you repeat, and, and you recite, and you remind, and you tell yourself, I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to say no to that, and I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to quit thinking about my human agenda, and I'm going to think about my divine agenda. I'm going to start thinking about that temporary pleasure, and I'm going to go for the long-term benefit. I'm going to do that. I'm going to tell myself that. I'm going to see that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. That's how you do it. You tell yourself. You see it and you tell yourself. This is, this is phreneo. It's what phreneo means. It means to focus your mind. I've given you, that word is found, I think, 11 times in the book of Philippians in four chapters. <laughs> As the book is really about that. And so we have a need. We have volition to attach faith to something we believe can meet that need. We start off attaching to the world and, and then we get saved and we begin to grow and now we can attach all of that to the Lord. I'll say this as we close. What is it in your life as far as what you dwell on, what you think about, what you imagine? Because that's pranao. For now, is to, is to sit around and imagining things. What is it in your temporal life that competes with the Lord? I mean, what do you think about a lot? I mean, do you think about, uh, okay, it's time to retire. I'm going to have this really, really cool life. You know, I'm going to play golf and fish and look at YouTube videos or whatever. You know, that's going to be my life. Or what is it that you're visualizing and imagining your life to be that is not connected to the Lord? That's what competes. And that's what you need to X out and delete and, and, and erase. You need to erase all that and, and turn and connect yourself to the promises of God and this image of yourself as mature and strong and faithful and loyal and generous and loving and giving. Man, this is who I am. This is who I am in Christ. This is who I want to be. This is who I'm going to be. This is who I am. You tell yourself, Father, help us to tell ourselves the truth. We can tell ourselves lies that if we had this life or that life, circumstances would make us happy. If I just had my health back, if I could just get my back fixed, 
you know, and be able to do the things I want to do. Man, life would be great. That's what life's about. It's about be, being able to do what I want to do whenever I want to do it with whoever I want to do it with. It's all about me, me, me getting what I want. Well, Lord, we know that's not true. And so help us to confront that in us that believes that, that keeps telling ourselves that, and help us to reconnect ourselves to you. Help me, Father, to attach my heart to you and be dependent on you. I love you, Father. I praise you now in Christ's name.